Dolores, how long did you live in this? Well, I lived in plaster Paris once for seven years. <laughs> and they would cut the sides open and put straps on. And then finally they started making plastic. And I lived in plastic ones for another seven and a half uh, years. What, what is this bump here? <laughs> on That's the where back. the bone came through the skin and was stuck out and had to wear a patch on that. In a body cast for 14 years, four fusions, one through the front, the other three through the back, two cordotomies to kill the pain. So this side of my body was numb from here down, this side from here down. Two weeks before I was healed, my husband and I made my funeral arrangements. You had a, a disease that your bones were becoming brittle yes. way before their time. Yes. Uh, and uh, when someone reaches a point that they're about ready to die, they're terminal, and their pain is unbearable, uh, they had a surgery back then, which they don't even do today. No. It's such a horrific surgery. Uh, what was it and what did they do? It was called percutaneous cordotomy where they go into the base of the brain through behind the ear and they burn out the nerve centers. So you can never feel again in the part of the body that they burn the nerve centers out. Now you had it on both sides, yes. which meant that um, you had no feeling from where? Your waist down? Well, or? on my right side, I had no feeling from my neck down. The left side from my waist down. And, and, there, and, and there's no reversal no. for this surgery. No. Uh, never in the history of the world no. Has it ever been reversed until that night when she went to the Catherine Kuhlman meeting? Now, Dolores loved God, but did not believe in miracles for today. She felt they ceased. And so when the mother of the housekeeper turned on this Catherine Kuhlman I show, what did you say miracle. to her? Turn it off. Why? Because I came from Pennsylvania. I was always told Catherine Kuhlman was a kook said she healed people and that wasn't true and I believed it. And what did the housekeeper's uh, his mother say to you? She said to me, what if you're keeping a door closed to God? And I had to respond because at that point I was waiting for an answer from God for my youngest son. You see, she had a, a young son. How old was he, Chris? He was 14. He, he was 14, and she was wondering what was going to happen to him when she died. Uh, because, uh, well, tell me about the orthopedic doctor that was a friend of yours when he told you you were going to die. What did he say? Well, when he came into the room, they wanted to take me in the hospital one more time, see if there was anything they missed or anything they could still do or anything they could learn to help somebody else. And... Uh, when they did all this checking and had a new neurosurgeon in to look at me and he said it's time to go. The tissues in my back were shredding even where that bone was through the skin and they couldn't even patch it. And he came in and sat down and he said, uh, I said, what's wrong? And he said, Dolores, there's nothing more we can do. And he said, I would give anything in this world to make you well and there's nothing to be done. And she heard mm -hmm. the voice of the Holy Spirit say to her, Catherine Coleman. And she knew somehow that if she went to the Catherine Coleman meeting, she would find out, uh, she'd, she'd have some peace of mind of what would happen right. to her son. You literally said to, you had chutzpah, you said to God, what did, what did you say to him? I told him, I will not die till you show me how you're going to take care of Chris. And he, he gave him to us. He's adopted. And he gave him to us after I was in my first body cast and then in a brace for several years. And uh, So did Chris ever see you normal? No. No, he never did. He never did. Okay. So uh, you, uh, you know you have to go to this meeting of this woman you don't care for. But, you know, I could go because it was a Methodist spirit, Holy Spirit conference. And I grew up Methodist. And I knew they weren't going to let her do anything out of order. Okay, so you get in the car to go to this conference. You get out, but you can't get out of the car yourself. So what do you do? Well, Gail always put me in and took me out. And, uh, and she couldn't get me out because the, the pain, this shoulder was deteriorated also, both wrists and all my fingers. What was going on with your organs? Heart and lungs were very bad, and my kidneys had clo started to close off, and that was what was killing me. And uh, this man stepped up and said, let me help. He reached in and picked me up and took me in. 
Gail parked the car and came in and he took us to seats. And uh, Catherine Coleman came out on stage and I thought, dear God, I can't stand to look at her. And the Lord said, you don't need to look at her, just listen. And so I closed my eyes and I was holding my head like this. And she said, tonight, I'm going to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. Now she's talking to Methodist pastors and lay leaders. It wasn't a healing service. No, it was not a healing service. In fact, they made her send her people home because they couldn't have healing. And, uh, and so I thought, I know the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of God. And she said, if you call him it, you don't know him. And suddenly something happened to me. And I had my eyes closed and I saw a little Kodak slide picture of Chris and a man on our front porch. And the man turned and looked at me and said, tell Chris he need never walk in the house alone. To tell him to take Jesus' hand and walk in and I'll walk in with him. But my name is Holy Spirit. And now you felt you had your answer. I had my answer. I was ready no, to go I, home. I said to Gail, let's go. And uh, Catherine Coleman had said somebody had an ear open and people started going up. And I thought, now she's putting on a sideshow. And I looked like I fit in a sideshow and I wanted out. So Gail handed me my cane and I started pulling myself to the edge of the seat so she could get me up. And as I did, my legs were on fire. And I thought, what is happening? And uh, the thought came to me that the bone that was out, the cast was putting pressure on it and making my legs burn. And wasn't I glad I only wore that one hour a day because Bill would get me up and let me sit up with them for an hour. The rest and, of the time you were in the bed. Yes, the rest of the time I was in bed. And, uh, and I thought that's what was happening. And finally, a man was down by my seat and he said, something's happening to you. And I said, my legs are burning. And he said, would you walk with me? And I said, get me out of here. So he got me up and he said, how can I help you? And I said, if you put one arm around me and then take this arm and with my cast, I can shuffle. So we started out. Of course, he felt the cast. And finally he said to me, have you ever had any surgeries? And I said, I had four spinal fusions and two percutaneous chordotomies. And nobody knew what percutaneous chordotomies were. So if I would say that to them, they wouldn't you, say anything. You could get rid of them. <laughs> I could get rid of them. And they would say, oh, and that was the end of it. But this man turned me to face him and he said, you've had four spinal fusions and two percutaneous chordotomies? And I said, yes. He said, isn't it strange that your legs are burning? And I thought, he knows what I'm talking about. But I wouldn't answer him. I just said yes. We went out to get to the lobby and he said to me, you can take your cast off if you want to. And my instant reaction was, dear God, these people are dangerous. <laughs> Never saw me before and telling me I can take my cast off. And, and I looked at him and I saw something. I didn't know what, but I saw something in him. And finally, he said to me, do you want to take it off? Sometimes people aren't willing to get healed. But I said, I've been in one of these things over 15 years and I'm dying. And he shook his head and I knew he knew. And I said, yes, I would want to take it off. He had me in the women's restroom with Gail in there helping me out of the cast, had the neck brace off. And he went out while she got this off me. And uh, when he came back in, she said to me, is something happening? And I said, no. She said, this isn't like you. I started to fasten my cast back up. But when that man stepped in the door, I knew he knew something. And I said, get this off me and get me to him. And he carried me out, and he and an usher carried me up on the platform. And Catherine was waiting for him. Let, let me interject something. What you don't know is this man that walked up to this Doris wasn't even supposed to be at this meeting. That's right. He was a medical doctor, mm -hmm. and he went. He felt God told him to go to the meeting mm -hmm. because he had a word of knowledge for one 
person. And although there were, what, a thousand people 3, there? Three thousand. Three thousand people. He walks directly up to Dolores. Mm -hmm. This was the one that God had selected. The reason he knew about the cardonomy is because he was a medical doctor. That's, That's right. why it didn't amaze him. He tells her to take this off. This is a uh, body brace and a neck cast. She takes it off. I'm, I'm still amazed you took it off, Dolores. <laughs> and and um, they carry her up to the platform where Miss Coleman is there. And what happened next? Then she said to me, walk. And I said, I can't walk. And I had very little voice <clears throat> because the cordotomy, the second the cordotomy, went, they went through the throat, paralyzed my vocal cords. Mm. And... Uh, and I didn't think she heard me when I said I can't because she said again, walk. And I pushed my foot out to show her I couldn't. Came up off the floor, it came down on the floor and I thought, I feel the floor. No, you can't feel the floor. But I had to get the other foot out because the men had not moved up and my body was so crooked I knew if they let go of me I would fall. So I pulled the other foot up and it came off the floor. It came down. And I thought, I feel the floor. No, you don't feel the floor. You can't feel the floor. And suddenly I felt in my fingertips, started going up. And they said, I was looking at my hand, and it got up so far, and I started screaming, I can feel, I can feel. She told me to walk. She had no idea what was going on. I ran on the platform, came back, and she said to me, bend over and my doctors could only bend me so far. And I started to bend over and realized I was free, I could bend. And I touched the floor. And there was a doctor from Dallas sitting on the platform and he didn't believe any of this. And he said, suddenly a hush fell. And he looked up and he saw my body straighten. And he said, if that doesn't make a believer out of you, nothing will. In other words, he saw your body mm. crooked and could see it yes. straighten yes. before his very eyes. Yes, and he said, uh, and the next year he introduced us at the, at the Methodist Holy Spirit Conference. But uh, I was in shock because I didn't believe anything like this. They tell me that you ran and you don't I even ran. remember it. No. How could you run? How could you do that to go, Dolores? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> this great miracle occurs. She goes mm -hmm. home in a state of shock. I have to ask you, what did your son that was so important to your adopted son say when he saw you? He ran out to the car and I was getting out of the car by myself for the first time he ever saw that happen. And he picked me up and started carrying me across the street screaming, you were healed, you were healed. But before we went, we had an incident where he said to me, mother, you're going to be healed. And I said, no, honey, that doesn't happen. And I'm not coming home any different than I'm going but I will have an answer for you. Can you understand that? And he said, yes, ma'am. And I jokingly say that was my last Methodist Presbyterian Sunday school lesson. <laughs> Miracles are not for today. How about the doctor? What was his reaction? He was so amazed. He was waiting for a phone call from Bill to say that I had died. And when he walked in the room, I told him, don't tell him I'm here. When he walked in the room and saw me, he said to me, what's happened? He said, you look different. What are you doing? And I said, I want you to check me. And he started checking me and he got me up on the table and I could turn over by myself. And he started writing his hands down my spine. And he said, it's straight. And this shoulder was so bad that he couldn't touch it before. And he was pressing on it and said, is that hurting? And I said, no, it's not hurting. And finally, he looked at me and he said, I suppose you want me to use the pin too? And I said, yes. And he barely touched my foot. And I said, it's sharp. He said, all right. He said, that's all. Tell me what happened, but let me sit down. And he sat on his stool and the tears just dripped. And I said to him, Van, tell me another way this could have happened. And he said, there is no other way. This is truly a miracle of God and you have work to do for him. I would like you to see mm -hmm. her husband, Bill, in his own words, describing the worst state that Dolores was in and the change. 
she was in the, we were in the kitchen and she was beating her fist upon the wall saying, Lord, why don't you take me? Last they weighed her, she weighed 73 pounds. And I'm sure at the time of healing, she weighed less than that. She was one though, the fact she got these percutaneous carotomies, they go into the base of the spine and they kill all the nerves to the feeling of your body. When she got that, uh, she was able then to maneuver a little bit more than, than usual. I never did this to the sense had to carry her, I had to assist her uh, in and out of bed and so on. We had a hospital bed and uh, they thought when she got the percutaneous cotyledomy that she was naturally going into a wheelchair and that was it. And the type of person she is, she wouldn't accept that. So she would, uh, in fact, she, around the house, she'd push a chair around. She walked like a spastic person at first because she could not have any feeling. She didn't know where her legs were. In order to move one leg, she had to look down and see which ones was forward in order to move the other one. So, uh, but I, I to say which is the worst time, I, I, I don't know, it was all, all pretty traumatic. She, uh, I guess the first thing I really noticed was her back was straight, it had never been because her one leg was an inch and a half shorter than the other because the hip had crushed up. And She's the only person in this world that we know that was healed of percutaneous cordotomies. It's an irreversible process.